thing of tartrate stability, I'm going to include not only tartrates but also oxalates since they are intimately associated with each other. And the three compounds that are formed, if you refer to the handout, are uh, <coughs> potassium bitartrate, calcium tartrate, and of course calcium oxalate. And all three of these substances can form crystalline deposits in wine under certain con conditions. They are a bit difficult to identify on microscopic examination because the <coughs> appearance of the crystals are going to vary with the amount of type or the amount and type, I should say, <coughs> of the other substances that I had mixed with them, for example, pigments, tannins, etc. Uh, the pure crystal, of course, have easily identifiable forms, but on deposit from wine, quite often it's difficult to say that this deposit is due to this particular form just from a microscopic examination. Unfortunately, new wines always contain an excess <coughs> of bitartrate. And of course, at cellar temperature, it's going to precipitate usually slowly, and <clears throat> as the tartrate solubility decreases with decreasing temperature, we hasten the precipitation to get rid of the excess by refrigerating the wine. And a relatively recent innovation, of course, has been ion exchange, say, <clears throat> 15 years ago. Now, the amount of tartaric acid that will remain in solution in wine depends upon several things. The alcohol content, that's given there in the handout. <clears throat> the temperature, the pH, potassium content, the calcium content, and certain other characteristics of the wine. And these certain other characteristics I'll go into in quite some detail later on. Now, if you look at your outline there, <clears throat> effective alcohol content, as expected with increase in alcohol content, the amount of bitartrate and calcium tartrate that remain in solution decreases. KHT, 12% alcohol, 0.277 grams per 100 cc's, and at 20% alcohol, 0.182. That is why bitartrate precipitates during fermentation as alcohol increases, and of course there's a further decrease in the content when alcohol is added to make fortified dessert wines. Effective temperature, look at the next table there, 20 degrees centigrade, KHT, 0.182, and at minus four degrees centigrade, 0.056. So that graphically illustrates the importance of refrigeration in causing precipitation of KHT. You notice the calcium tartrate also decreases, but refrigeration is a very ineffective way of decreasing calcium tartrate because the precipitation rate is so slow compared with potassium bitartrate. The effect of pH, again refer to the table, you see the tartaric acid solution dissociates first <coughs> the undissociated tartaric acid into the hydrogen ion plus the half dissociated acid, the HT ion, and the HT ion further dissociates into hydrogen plus the tartrate ion. Now, the extent of this dissociation, and therefore the percentage of the total tartrate that's going to be present in these three forms, undissociated, half dissociated, fully dissociated, is dependent upon the pH of the solution. 
And if you refer to the dissociation curve, you'll see why that is so. This is the dissociation of tartaric acid in a 12% alcohol <coughs> water solution. And you can see that the percentage of the HT, the one we're mainly interested in, at a pH of 2.8, 36% of it is in the form of HT ion. At a pH of around 3.6, <coughs> around 3.65, around 66% is in the form of HT. And at 4.4 pH, around 38 to, <clears throat> or around 38% is in the form of HT. Now that is why, and I want to stress this, a change in pH in a wine can either have a favorable effect upon keeping the tartrate in solution or an unfavorable effect. <clears throat> either a raise in pH or a lower in pH. It all depends on what pH you start at. If you're on <clears throat> the high side of the pH, say so you have a pH of 4, and you drop the pH down to <clears throat> about 3.65, you're quite apt to get a tartrate precipitation because you've increased the percent of the total charge rate that's in the HT form. On the other hand, if you're on the low side, say a pH of 3.2, raised to 3.6, you'll have the same effect there. So pH is a very decisive factor in determining the amount of uh, tartrate or bitartrate that will remain in solution. Any questions on this dissociation curve? Hope you understand it because there's usually a question in the midterm about it. Is it only the H T form that precipitates out? The H2T form does not react to either potassium or calcium. The H T form will react with potassium to precipitate, and the T double minus form will react with calcium to precipitate. The T double minus form will also react with potassium, but the potassium tartrate is <clears throat> very soluble compared with the potassium bitartrate. So potassium tartrate is not a factor in precipitation, it's only potassium bitartrate. And in the case of the fully dissociated tartaric acid, the T double minus, it's the calcium that's the factor. You can see the effect of the potassium and the calcium content because the potassium reacts with the <clears throat> half dissociated acid, the HT, to form the salt, the KHT, and the calcium, of course, reacts with the T double minus to form the calcium tartrate. Remember that as the pH is increased, the danger of a calcium tartrate precipitation increases directly because looking at the dissociation curve, the higher the pH, the more the total tartrate that's in the form of the T double minus, the one that will react with calcium. This is not true of the HT, because raising the pH can either decrease or increase the amount that's going to be in the form of the HT. Any questions on that? The, uh, H2T completely soluble? Yes. It will, the H2T form is unavailable for a reaction with either the calcium or the potassium. So its solubility is very great compared with the solubility of the corresponding salts. <clears throat> so much so that you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. Any other questions? Well, to sum up, <clears throat> the amount of potassium or calcium and tartaric acid that will remain in solution under specified conditions depends primarily upon the amounts that are in the form of the potassium ion, the HT ion, calcium, and the T double minus ions. 
and for alcohol water solutions <clears throat> saturated with KHT or CAT. This relationship is best expressed by the solubility product. That's given there in the outline. Solubility product for potassium bitartrate is equal to the <clears throat> concentration of potassium expressed in moles per liter times the concentration of the HT form of the tartrate also expressed in moles per liter. And in the case of the <clears throat> calcium tartrate, it's the concentration of calcium times the concentration of the tartrate, which is in the form of the T double minus sign, again expressed in moles per liter. And that is the only way we have of expressing the amount <clears throat> of potassium bitartrate, the amount of calcium tartrate that will stay in solution in alcohol water solution. And this magnitude, of course, is going to vary with temperature and alcohol content. The higher the alcohol content, the less will stay in solution, and the lower the temperature, the less will stay in solution. I'm speaking now of a solution of potassium bitartrate or calcium tartrate in alcohol water, not in wine. Now, why do we use this method of determining the amount which will remain in solution? Very simple. Whenever the concentrations <clears throat> exceed the value of the solubility product, you're going to get precipitation. So we have a mathematical means of determining the amount that's going to stay in solution. We can calculate it from analysis for the potassium content and the HT content or the calcium content and the T double minus content. So knowing the solubility of <clears throat> potassium bitartrate and calcium tartrate in various alcohol water solutions, and knowing the dissociation constants <clears throat> of tartaric acid in these same solutions, both the first and second dissociation constants, solubility products have been calculated for both KHT and CAT over the range of alcohol concentration and temperatures that have interest to enologists. And this <coughs> calculation and the tables are given in the references that are at the end of the uh, lecture outline. So all you have to do is Look at these tables, and you can de determine the solubility products at any given alcohol concentration at any given temperature. In other words, it's been done for you. You don't have to do it yourself. I might say in doing this work, this is work is done, oh, I think back in the middle 50s, something like that, if I remember correctly. We've made a very extensive search of the literature looking for the dissociation constants of <clears throat> the <clears throat> tartaric acid in various alcoholic concentrations. And starting with work done very recently, we traced it back and they all cited a certain first and second dissociation constant in various alcoholic solutions. And finally traced it back to work that was done in about 1904 and found then that they had not actually been determined. They had been calculated on the assumption that alcohol would have a certain effect upon the dissociation constants. So that's <clears throat> one of the reasons why if you're really interested in something, trace it back to the earliest citation you can possibly find, because quite often you'll find that subsequent investigators will cite a previous investigator, previous investigator will cite a more previous investigator and so on, and you get back to the original source and find out that the original investigator was wrong. And over a period of 30 or 40 years, and maybe 50, everyone's been using the wrong data. So we had to determine it. Any questions at this point? The people in winery practice go through and use these tables and actually look stuff up and try and figure out the KSP for the ones. Well, it's a lot simpler now. There's a, there's a slide rule that's put out by uh, one advisory board that'll do it for you. All you have to do is make the analysis. In practice, do they even do that? Yes. 
Well, we've been talking about the <clears throat> concentration products or solubility products of uh, alcohol water solutions. Now I want to talk about not solubility products, because solubility product refers to a known solution. And when we get <clears throat> potassium and tartaric acid in wine, we're no longer working with a known solution. So we won't use the term solubility product, we use the term concentration product. And if you look at the, <clears throat> at the bottom of your lecture outline, you'll see that the concentration product for KHT in wine is calculated differently from the solubility product of KHT in an alcohol water solution. Again, it's the moles per liter of potassium times the moles per liter of total tartrate times the percent of the total tartrate that's in the form of the HT. And the reason we have to make this modification is because, as that dissociation curve shows you, the amount of the total tartrate that's in a specified form is affected by the pH. Now, if you make a saturated solution, potassium bitartrate, and alcohol water solution, the pH is fixed. And you don't have to worry about the percent that's in the HT form because you know what it is. But in wine, which can be any pH from, say, 2.7 up to 4.4, you cannot make that assumption. You have to adjust for the pH of the wine and the effect it has upon the dissociation of the tartaric acid, which in turn determines the percentage of the total tartrate that's in the form of the HT or the T double minus ion. Now, to determine these concentration products <clears throat> requires measurement of the pH of the wine first. It also requires analysis for the alcohol content. We must know the pH of the wine. We must know the alcohol content of the wine. And we must also analyze for the amounts of potassium and total tartrate. And if we're interested in the possibility of a calcium tartrate uh, concentration product exceeding the solubility level, and we must also analyze for calcium. But speaking of potassium bitartrate alone, alcohol, pH, the total tartrate that's present, and of course the amount of potassium. And potassium is most easily determined by the flame photometer, as is calcium, though it requires pretreatment for the determination of calcium by the flame photometer. pH, of course, pH meter, alcohol, a bouillonscope or bouillometer is good enough for this purpose, and tartrate by the colorimetric metavanidate procedure. With a spectrophotometer and a colorimeter, the analysis required is very, very simple and can be done very, very rapidly. Well, you make these analyses and then you refer to published tables. And these tables are given in some of these references that are appended at the end of the lecture outline. If you refer to these tables, having these data that you've determined by analysis, the table will give the total percent of the tartrate that you've determined by analysis. It will give the total percent that is in the form of the HT ion or the T double minus sign, whichever one you happen to be concerned with. So all you have to do is make these analyses, refer to these published tables, and it'll give you the percent of the total tartrate that's in the form of the HT ion. And then with these values, you can calculate the concentration product. You still with me? Okay. That's why I give these references into these lecture outlines. I can show you every one of these references that I give you are important. 
if you're interested in mastering the subject matter that's covered in lecturing in this course. I've been working on this matter of tartrate stability for some 20 odd years, and uh, I feel by now I know a little bit about it. Now, we're going to discuss tartrate stability in wine. And this is where the thing really gets sticky. Well, from these formulas for calculating the concentration product, we can see, of course, that if we remove enough KHT or CAT by refrigeration to drop it below the concentration product for a particular alcohol and temperature, that it's going to be stable, it's going to remain in solution. Or on the other hand, we can remove either potassium or calcium or tartrate by ion exchange and accomplish the same result. So we get this CP down below <clears throat> that determined by work and reported in published tables. Then we do not longer have to fear the possibility of a bitartrate precipitation when our wine goes to the market. So the first work that we did, <clears throat> we set up the alcohol water solutions and determined the solubility at the various temperatures of interest to enologists. And then we would calculate a solution, that is a wine, and say if the CP did not exceed that given in the tables for these alcohol water solutions, we could be perfectly certain that we would not encounter bitartrate precipitation at the specified temperature and alcoholic concentration. Well, this was good as far as it went. However, as we all know, wine is not a simple alcohol water solution. In fact, it's a very, very complex solution with some, something over 300 known individual chemical compounds identified to date. And these formulas that I've given you here for the concentration product <laughs> is based on the assumption that all the tartrate is available as either H2T, HT, or T double minus, depend upon the pH of the solution. And that all the potassium and all the calcium are available in the form of <clears throat> the ions, that is potassium or calcium ions. And these assumptions are erroneous. So that's why de determining safe levels of potassium bitartrate in wine is rather a sticky problem. Because not all of the tartrate is available. Not all of the, of the calcium is available. And that's what makes wine <clears throat> such a different solvent for potassium bitartrate or calcium tartrate. Another assumption that's made in this calculation for concentration product is that at a given temperature, equilibrium is very quickly achieved. That is also not true, as I will show you later on. Well, another result is that the amount of potassium bitartrate that will remain in solution in wine is a great deal larger than the amount of remaining solution in an alcohol water mixture. In the case of whites, from two to five or six times. In the case of reds, from three up to 10 or 12 times the amount of remaining solution in water. And that's been the source of a great deal of research work over the years <clears throat> as to why this is so what are the factors involved, and can we develop analytical methods for measuring these factors, and therefore come up with a very precise 
modified calculation for concentration products of KHT in wine. Well, the factors affecting tartrate stability may be grouped under <coughs> two headings. One, those that affect precipitation rate. As I'll show you later on, this is a very important factor because as far as we know, equilibrium is not reached at a given low temperature for potassium bitartrate in wine over a period of several hundred days and perhaps never. And even more aggravated in the case of the calcium tartrate. <clears throat> the other set of factors that are of great importance are those of complex tartrates and calcium. So you have factors affecting the precipitation rate and factors affecting the complexing of tartrate and calcium. Yes? How many times more on the <coughs> or the reds? Pardon? How many times more soluble in the red wine? Oh, from <clears throat> three up to as high as 13 times. First, I want to talk about precipitation factors. All wines <clears throat> newly made are supersaturated solutions of potassium bitartrate. If you'll examine <clears throat> a intact grape berry by careful dissection of it, you'll usually find potassium bitartrate crystals embedded in the cell walls because of the fact that the solubility in water has been exceeded. So you're starting out with a <clears throat> solution which is supersaturated with respect to water. You put it through a fermentation, the alcohol further decreases the among which remain in solution. So uh, wines, newly made wines, are very much supersaturated solutions of potassium bitartrate. They have a great deal more potassium bitartrate than they, will, than they will, are able to hold in solution. Now, <clears throat> one of the most effective methods we have for reducing the amount of potassium bitartrate, of course, is refrigeration, low temperature. But the rate at which a given wine will precipitate by tartrates when held at a given low temperature will vary greatly among wines. Because the rate of precipitation is going to depend upon the characteristics of the individual wine or wines. And that is why I gave you that wide range of 3 to 13 times the holding power of red wines over an alcohol water solution. So that's what makes this determination of safe concentration products in wines complicated because you have this tremendously wide range of the ability of wines to hold tartrates in solution. <coughs> Now this precipitation occurs in two stages. You have crystal formation <clears throat> and then crystal growth. Crystal growth to the point where the crystal becomes large enough to either precipitate out or to be fillered out. And for crystal formation to occur, of course, you need nuclei. And this is I believe to be the reason for the observed differences among different types of wines on the rate of precipitation. We've observed differences between red and white wines on the rate of precipitation, between table and fortified, dry and sweet, young and old, betonited and not betonited. All these things affect the rate of the potassium bitartrate precipitation. 
For example, white wines, the bitartrate will precipitate faster, much easier than a little from reds. So it's usually simpler to cold stabilize a white wine than it is a red wine. There are exceptions, but as a general rule, white table wines particularly are much easier to bitartrate stabilized by refrigeration than our reds. And high sugar wines will precipitate slower than dry wines or low sugar wines because the sugar inhibits the nuclei formation. Old wines will precipitate slower than young wines. So those are some of the comparisons. And this is the reason why <clears throat> the wines with the low or lower tartrate precipitation rates are said to be more tartrate stable. Because before the advent of and the usage of concentration products, the usual test for tartrate stability was to hold the wine at a given low temperature over a period of time. And those wines that would not precipitate during this holding period were said to be tartrate stable. Whereas <clears throat> the chances were probably 99.99 to 1 that they were, had not reached by tartrate equilibrium. They were just slow and precipitating, slow enough so that they did not precipitate by tartrate during the low temperature holding period. Now, I'll give you data later on to substantiate that statement. <laughs> this all clear? <clears throat> alcohol causes bitartrate precipitation. The higher the alcohol content, the less bitartrate will remain in solution. Any other questions? I didn't catch what you said about crystal formation. You said that uh, there's something. About crystal formation must be preceded by nuclei formation. The nuclei, you might envision them as being a very, very, very small crystal. And we think that the reason for the difference in observed behavior of these different types of wines on the precipitation rate is mainly due to the effect on the nuclei formation. Well, those are precipitation factors. Unless there's some other questions, I'm going on now to the complexing factors. We have very good evidence that complexing of tartrates <clears throat> is a very important factor in determining the amount of bitartrate that will remain in solution. I'm going to confine myself here on to bitartrate because that's the main problem we deal with. <clears throat> and calcium tartrate does pose a problem occasionally, but bitartrate is usually the substance that we want to stabilize the wines for. For example, the concentration product will decrease with increasing tartrate content. Now stop and think what that means. If tartrate is complexed and you add more tartrate, you can easily exceed the complexing power of the wine and your free tartrate, which, is, which you've added, which is not complex, because you've exceeded the complexing power of the constituents in the wine, which are complex in tartrate, it's going to cause a precipitation of uh, potassium bitartrate, and then your calculated concentration of product will be lower. <coughs> now, we have very good experimental evidence for that. In fact, we've done it time after time after time. And there's no disputing the fact that if you add tartaric acid to wines, that you're going to get tartrate precipitation, and you're going to get a decrease in the concentration product. On the other hand, if we add magnesium to wine, 
we'll invariably get an increase in the concentration product because magnesium is one of the things that will complex tartaric acid. And so complex in it'll hold it tightly enough that it's unable to react with the potassium. <clears throat> it's very doubtful that potassium is complexed. But we know that a number of things will complex calcium. I'll just mention this briefly. Citric acid from one can tie up calcium so tightly that it will not react it with uh, tartaric. And work over the last, oh, I guess 10 years, 12 years, something like that, has shown that in red wines, the pigments are the main complexing materials present. And that is the reason why red wines will hold a lot more bitartrate in solution than whites, because the reds have the pigments and the whites don't. We have proven that in a number of ways. One, by decolorizing the wines. And if we decolorize a wine, say we have a red wine that will hold five times as much tartrate in solution as equivalent alcohol water solution. If we decolorize it with carbon, make it white, then we have brought the holding power of that wine down to just about the equivalent of an alcohol water solution. We have additional evidence that tartrate <coughs> complex is a factor. We find that if we clarify our wines with bentonite, <coughs> or if we ion exchange these wines, either action, or either operation will reduce the amount of potassium bitartrate which that wine can hold in solution. For an example, <clears throat> we did a lot of work on this and we found that in adding anywhere from two and a half to ten pounds of bentonite to a thousand gallons of wine, We reduce the CP of dry whites from 15 to 18 percent, and of dry reds from 25 to 32 percent, just from adding bentonite. So you can see that the addition of bentonite does have a, an effect on the tartrate holding power of a wine. Ion exchange can be even more drastic in its effect. Here's percent of the wine which is exchanged. We exchange 25%, 50% of the lot of wine, 75%, and 100%. And here is a percent decrease in concentration product. Dry white, dry red. 70% decrease to 25, 39, 66, and 93. And the reds, 21. 38, 70, and 89. In other words, if we exchange all of a lot of wine, we've practically destroyed the tartrate holding power of that wine. So you bet I clarify a wine to <clears throat> achieve stability, and you decrease the holding power of the wine for by tartrate. You ion exchange a wine to achieve tartrate stability in the same time that you ion exchange it, you're reducing the power of that wine to hold tartrates in solution. So that's a bit ironic. 
The ion exchange of wine to achieve tartrate stability, the same thing by decreasing the power of that wine to hold tartrates in solution. Well, <clears throat> what's the use of all this, what we've been discussing? There's a great dichotomy among the so-called basic scientists or researchers and the applied. <clears throat> I like to think of myself as an applied researcher. It's been my experience that any time I start in on an applied problem, I end up doing some basic research because it's necessary to get the answer. In other words, what's the utility of this work? How can we use it? If you look at the second sheet of the lecture outline, I think the data there confirms my statement that wines are supersaturated solutions of tartrates. These wines store to 25 degrees Fahrenheit, sharing material and port. The bitartrate contents at zero of the sure mat is 0.207, after 28 days is 0.104, after 56 days is 0.085. In other words, it is still precipitating KHT after 56 days, as was true of the port. And we have stored wines up to 200 days and found that there is still precipitating bitartrate. So that's why we think that it's doubtful that a wine, at least a red wine, will ever reach tartrate equilibrium at a given temperature. The first few days, the rate of precipitation is usually great, and then it starts decreasing. And if you plot time against tartrate precipitation over a long period of time, eventually your curve will become practically asthmatotic. In other words, the decrease is so slow, it's difficult to measure, but with sensitive enough techniques, you will still be able to show the tartrates are precipitating, at least over a period of 200 days. Yes? Professor Burke, if uh, the laundry operation, if you would uh, just uh, normally uh, cold stabilize every wine without doing any uh, laboratory checks on the tartrate stability, but just routinely stabilize it, what are the chances of you bringing to tartrate stability in uh, bottled wine? If you're real lucky, every wine would be stable. If you're real unlucky, 50 or 60% of your wines would be bottle unstable. Well, that's an ass nine way of doing it. <laughs> Refrigeration is one of the most expensive operations that you subject your wines to. The only more expensive one is fining where you're losing costly wine and lees. And also refrigeration can do damage to the quality of the wine because when wine is at refrigeration temperature, it will hold double the amount of oxygen in solution that will at cellar temperature. And as your wine warms up after refrigeration, then the oxygen reacts and you're doing damage to the wine. Unless you take pains to not introduce air into the wine during the refrigeration. Also in refrigeration, the longer the wine's refrigerated, in the case of red wines, the more red color you're going to drop out. And <clears throat> ordinarily, you want to retain as much of the red color as possible. So the only sensible thing to do is to follow the drop in tartrates with time on refrigeration. Analyze two, four, six days and keep on analyzing until the drop in tartrates is not sufficiently great to continue the refrigeration, or until you reach a safe level of CP, which happens to come first. As a general rule, we say that six days refrigeration for tartrate stabilization is a good figure to use if you're going to go at it blind. In some wines, a few wines, you're going to over-refrigerate. 
and another one is you're going to under-refrigerate. But as a general rule, if you're going to do it empirically, about six days. But we have <coughs> a great deal of data showing that there is an appreciable tartrate drop and the safe concentration product cannot be reached after 27 to 36 days. In other cases, have been reached in the first two or three days. And in other cases, <coughs> there is a appreciable drop of tartrates up to a period of six days, eight days, and then the drop is so slow after that it didn't warrant continued refrigeration. So it's just a matter of common sense. Well, this uh, slow precipitation rate, but continued precipitation, is why wines occasion that will pass the usual cold test, which is two days to four days at uh, 23 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit for table wines, and 16 to 18 degrees for dessert wines. Pass it without any problem, flying colors, and then later on precipitate tartrates in the bottle. That's the reason why. Because the precipitation rate was slow enough that it did not precipitate tartrates during the test period. <coughs> but with time in the bottle at a higher temperature, and the rate of precipitation is temperature dependent, of course. But over a period of time at a higher temperature, tartrates would form in the bottle. And I've seen this happen many, many times. And that's why we recommend the use of concentration products in place of the usual cold test, because the concentration products are practically foolproof if properly used, rather than depend upon the empirical cold test. Wine actually will help hold several times what the amount of the concentration product uh, is predicted. It seems like you're really overkilling if you have to get below that value. Well, that's why we came up with what we call practical safe levels of concentration products. Oh. Okay. Well, sorry, any questions? This is it. Also the